Joe Sunai's best and brightest here um, to help kind of uh, walk us through some of the highlights of DW. Um, please save all questions for the very end of the session today, just to make sure we get through all the different speakers today. Um, so first up will be Amy. Okay. So um, the good news, I was going to do GI cancers, but um, it's a little thin because ASCO was the same weekend as DDW. Um, so there was almost no cancer work um, presented at DDW because everybody was in Chicago, which won't happen next year. Um, but I thought this would be interesting for everybody because um, we're all interested in interval cancers, missed cancers, um, and the colon. So this is um, from um, Jules Salander and Randy Burt's group in Utah um, looking at clinical and molecular um, interval cancers. This is a population-based study um, coming out of Utah. Um, and so they want to look at the interval colorectal cancers. Um, you know, there's a lot in the literature about why we have interval cancers. Is it different biology? Are we missing them because of PrEP um, and the right colon? Um, and their aim was essentially to use this large data set and compare the clinical and pathologic and then molecular phenotypes of um, interval and missed cancers. So this is a population-based study um, going from 95 to 09 um, colon cancer cases in Utah, so um, generalizable to that extent. Um, and they identified, um, they defined interval colon cancers as those that developed within five years of a colonoscopy, so that's not um, always the typical definition. And then what they did was they would say it identified um, these patients, they frequency matched them in a one-to-one -one ratio by age, sex, and hospital site. Um, with those that had a detected col uh, colon cancer at the um, colonoscopy, um, at the patient's first recorded colonoscopy. And then what they did, which was kind of cool, is they were able to go back and get the specimens and look at them for microsatellite instability, um, SIMP, KRAS, and um, BRAF status. So they had about 2,500 cases of colon cancer. Um, what I thought was interesting was 6% of these were interval cancers, as by their definition. Um, and of those, 84 um, had archived tissue, and they were matched to 84 uh, controls, as I already described. Um, and as anticipated, um, interval colon cancers were more likely to be in the proximal colon and to be earlier stage, um, which I think is uh, information that we have already. And this just basically shows it um, in their table format that 54, more than half of the interval cancers were in the proximal colon, um, and about half were uh, stage one. Um, but what was interesting was when they looked at the molecular characteristics, um, BRAF, KRAS, microsatellite instability, um, and the SIMP pathway, um, they found that only microsatellite instability was associated with having the um, interval cancers. And so um, this is getting at what type of polyp um, we have, if it's a serrated polyp um, uh, or other uh, characteristics like that. And they found that um, about a quarter of the interval cancers were microsatellite unstable. I can send you these, Noam, if you want. Oh, I saw Noam looking, because my font is small. Um, and again, in multivariable logistic regression, microsatellite instability um, had an odds ratio of 4.2, being associated with um, an interval colon cancer. And there was, importantly, there was no difference in five-year survival between um, the two groups stratified by molecular marker. Um, so their conclusion was that interval cancers are more likely to rise in the proximal colon. Um, that's not really breaking news, um, but that they demonstrate microsatellite instability. Um, they postulated differences in tumor biology. Um, importantly, they didn't actually have family history information, which would be important because if all of these microsatellite instable um, patients are the ones that are, you know, the unidentified Lynch patients or so on and so forth, um, that could clearly explain the difference. Um, but they said additional studies are needed to determine if these are familial cancer pathways or some sort of accelerated neoplastic pathway. Um, and that's that. All right. And then um, something else that's interesting, I think, for many of us here is the um, young onset colon cancer, um, trying to dive into that piece a little bit. So this comes out of... Um, the group at Harvard who has the nurses' health study um, and the physicians' health study, um, and uh, Andy Chan also is at MGH. And so they looked at obesity and young onset uh, colorectal cancer. Um, I don't need to tell any of you guys all of uh, this stuff that we're seeing more young onset colon cancer and that there's limited evidence to suggest that obesity might um, contribute in part there. So they looked at a few things. So um, they looked at body shape at a young age. Um, BMI at age 18 and the current BMI, so they had sort of a delta in weight gain um, and weight change. Um, and, they, and they also um, looked at, for the body shape, they looked at sort of a pear-shaped, apple-shaped, um, other 
uh, descriptive factors for um, body shape. Um, and for this study, uh, they used the Nurses' Health Study 2, um, which is primarily women, about 85,000 women. It's ongoing since 1989. Um, and they collected all of this um, data in a pretty standard fashion, um, including history of endoscopic procedures, and then reports of colon cancer were collected using their um, validated questionnaires, and they ascertained the cases of colorectal cancer through search of the National Death Index and me uh, Medical Record Review, and used Cox um, proportional hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals um, to analyze the results. So out of those 85,000 um, individuals, they found 121 young onset colon cancers, um, and that was defined as under the age of 50, um, but over 22 here. And that encompassed um, about 1.5 million person years. Um, and compared with those individuals who had a lower BMI, the hazard ratio for women who had a BMI over 30 um, was almost 2, 1.92. And they did subgroup analysis, and this was um, consistent for those who had both a family history of colon cancer and those who did not, and it seemed to be um, sporadic tumors, and also those who had and had not had an endoscopy within 10 years. Um, and a BMI over 30 was significantly associated with colon cancer and not significantly associated with rectal cancer. So it doesn't, it seems to be more in the colon and not in the rectum. Um, they also found that there was a, chain, um, a change within uh, gaining weight. So compared to women who had maintained their weight um, within five kilograms since adolescence, those who had gained 40 kilograms or more had a hazard ratio, again, about 1.96. Um, and body shape itself was not associated with young onset risk of colon cancer. So they concluded that um, obesity and weight gains associated with increased risk of young onset colon cancer. Um, recent increase in incidence may be due to the rising prevalence of obesity, particularly in childhood um, or adolescence. Um, and perhaps that could help us sort of guide our screening, um, and they said the typical further investigations are needed. Thank you, Amy. Ari? <laughs> All right, this is the FMT update. We'll talk about UC, IBS, C. diff, PSC, and GBHD, because throw shit on something, it'll stick. All right. Uh, this is the series uh, therapeutics study. This is they're using their product series 101, uh, a multiple dose phase 1B study to evaluate the efficacy, safety, and microbiome dynamics of their product, CR 287, in subject with mild to moderate UC. So these were patients who had Mayo 4 to 10 and were randomized to receive one of four arms. They either got placebo or vancomycin prior to this microbiome product. Now, the interesting thing about series is it is, an, it is a narrow spectrum product. So I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. There's two camps. There's full spectrum, which is just taking everything in the microbiome and putting it into a blender and putting it into a pill or a, a, um, an enema. Or you can select certain criteria, certain bacteria that you want to be in your product. And that's what series is. So they put ethanol into the mixture of shit, and then it kills everything except for the sporulated bacteria. And so that's what their whole product is. It's sporulated bacteria. Um, and so what they did is they randomized patients to, again, either receiving placebo or vancomycin, and then placebo, weekly capsules, um, weekly capsules with Vanco or daily capsules. And this is what they found, that remission, which was a Mayo score of less than or equal to 2 with an endoscopic subscore of 0 or 1, uh, that 40% of the patients who got pre-treated with Vanco and then daily uh, microbiome product was significantly better than those who got placebo. Uh, and they got a 40% uh, result at their 8-week um, mark. There's a couple of interesting things about this study, which is they, they looked at the, the microbiome, sort of, did they do anything? Was it, was it the product? Was it the Vanco? And they looked at the microbial engraftment, specifically the bugs that are in their product, did they stay in the patients? And what they found is that at day 84, if you got the real stuff but were pre-treated with vancomycin, that that sporulated bacteria tend to stay inside of the patient's gut, suggesting that this was the active ingredient and what made them better. 
uh, there will be a phase three study that will be that's actually enrolling in the next couple of weeks or so. So we'll get a lot more data uh, from there. Uh, a lot of studies on IBS. Um, three of them, these were all randomized control trials. This was a study done at, um, at Montefiore with Olga. She took patients who had IBS-D and gave them three days of crapsules. Um, there was some benefit in the post-infection irritable bowel syndrome group, but otherwise it was a negative study. This is a group out of Germany. They, this was actually at the plenary. They gave NJ tube delivery of um, a fresh stool, and this was given one time. And at the 12-week mark, 49% were had improvement in bloating versus 29% who received placebo. There's actually no discussion about what actually happened to the, the IBS component in terms of their bowel movements. That wasn't their endpoint. It was bloating was their endpoint. Uh, this is another study looking at crapsules for 12 days, and they extended it to six months. And the interesting thing about this study is that placebo was better than <laughs> their product. This was a small poster in the very corner of the <laughs> FMT studio. Um, so the bottom line is that the jury is still very far away from making any conclusions about FMT in IBS. All right. Um, this, no one knew that this was being done. This is being done in Norway. The guy gets up there. He's seven feet tall. You can't miss this guy. He's enormous. And the first thing he says is, my presentation is now on New England Journal of Medicine for your review. Everyone immediately is like, oh, my God, <laughs> takes out their phones. And this is his study. 20 inpatients were randomized to receive flagell for 10 days for FMT, for the incipient C. diff infection. This is primary C. diff. This is not, no one's really done this before. So nine patients received an FMT enema, 11 received metronidazole. If at day four you were still having diarrhea, you could get another course of antibiotics. So for the metronidazole group, that means they got switched to Vanco. And if you got an FMT, that means they got flagell. The primary endpoint was clinical cure at day 70. And so this is what they found. And so the, the way they presented their data is, if you were better at 70 days, no matter what you got, whether you just got the primary treatment, FMT or metronidazole, or if you needed a second treatment during that period of time, at day 70, it doesn't matter what you got, if you were cured, you were cured. So what they found is that there was no statistical difference between those who were randomized to getting metronidazole up front or FMT. But if you looked at if just what happened with the initial treatment, Five out of patients who got metronidazole were better at day 70, and five patients who got FMT were better at day 70. And so the take-home was that there was no difference between if you got FMT or metronidazole. Now, a lot, a lot of flaws in this study. Um, shocked, honestly, that it's in New England Journal of Medicine. Even though it's a correspondence, still I'm sort of surprised. Um, Flat flagell, metronidazole, is no longer standard of care. You don't use that in patients, period. These were hospitalized patients. So hospitalized patients meet criteria for getting vancomycin regardless. So um, a lot of more research has to come from this. And they're actually doing a phase two trial, which will um, hopefully elicit some of that information. It was all over the place. Um, we are not recommending that now. But um, we're talking with others about doing a similar study here in the, in the States. Um, other things, this is from uh, Boston, from Jessica Allegretti's group at Brigham, looking at FMT and PSC. And what they found is that a third of patients had a decrease in their ALFOS after a single FMT, and uh, three quarters of patients had at least a drop in one of their abnormal L LFTs at, uh, at one month. They conclude we need more data. That's their conclusion. Um, what's interesting is that the single FMT had dramatic improvement in their microbial engraftment, and so the diversity index of their bacteria all, I mean, they almost all went up except for two patients, suggesting that engraftment is something that we can potentially look for. Uh, this was a, a six-year-old kid with AML who had a refractory GVHD. He was on Tacro, he was on Remicade, he was on Methylpred, and he was having five loose bowel movements a day. He got FMT uh, via both a jejunostomy and 
colonoscopy, and then very quickly all of his symptoms improved. Um, so at day seven, he was, he was back to his baseline, and at one month, he was at his baseline. They actually have six-month data that he was doing remarkably well off of all three of these agents, suggesting that there's something going on here. Now, um, Dave at Sloan, they have a protocol for this, so I hope that you get involved. Um, but this is a new thing that people are looking at in terms of uh, that. Um, real quick, there's a lot of data and trials going on with FMT. Um, there are three products that are shooting to get to market first. This is a enema. This is from Rebiotics. The data is not better than uh, placebo in some of their trials. Series, which is this sporulated narrow spectrum product. Again, pretty not such good data actually, and it was no better than placebo in their phase two trial. Uh, and I think this is actually going to be the winner probably, Finch, uh, which is a standoff from Open Biome. Uh, their data, their, their, again, Crapsules, this is full spectrum, 88% um, versus 25% in placebo, and they'll be moving to phase three trials shortly. Uh, and that, uh, that is that. Thank you, Ari. That was craptastic. Chris? All right, thank you. So I will go over some, uh, I, I thought it was pretty light this year for a endoscopy standpoint, a lot of rehash of old topics, nothing really exciting, but I'll touch on colon polyp detection, post-EMR bleeding, uh, endoscopic management of diabetes, and uh, we'll talk about some cyst stuff. So obviously, you know, the bread and butter of what we do is colon cancer prevention and colon polyp detection. And there is a lot of interest over the past several years of using inexpensive uh, adjunctive tools with standard colonoscopes in order to improve colon uh, or adenoma detection rate. And two of these, um, the ones that are most commonly used are endocuff. So there's just little plastic cap with these little arms. And as you withdraw the scope, the arms pull back and flatten the fold so you can see polyps that may be hiding behind folds. And similarly, uh, which do the same exact thing. The other, the other uh, interesting or the other uh, modality that receives a lot of interest is the fuse scope, the one with uh, the near 360 degree view. And I know when we were upgrading our uh, colonoscopy or our, our uh, processors, we talked about perhaps incorporating that into uh, the hospital here or in the ambulatory surgical center. So this was a um, large uh, multi-center randomized trial comparing standard high-definition colonoscopy versus endocuff versus endo rings and versus the fuse system uh, with the primary outcome looking at uh, rate of conventional adenomas per colonoscopy and then obviously the more standard uh, adenoma detection rate, sessile serrated polyp detection and insertion times. So they randomized over a thousand patients. It was basically out of three centers, Indiana with NYU uh, with Seth Gross and a group in Italy. So the results, and I'll just read it off because it's much easier. So overall, the adenoma, the adenomas per colonoscopy rate were all of these modalities, whether it was standard uh, white high definition scope whether you use endo cuff or endo rings, all of these were better than the fuse system. And these are all by high volume experts and, and high polyp detectors. Endo cuff was significantly better than the control group or the endo rings group in adenomas per colon. Um, in particular, right sided uh, adenomas per colonoscopy was significantly higher for the endo cuff group uh, compared to all the others. So endo cuff seemed to be the winner there. Um, the adenoma detection rate, all three of these were also higher than the fuse system. And if you took fuse out of it, the endo cuff was better than control or endo rings. There was no difference in detection of sessile serrated polyps uh, with any of the modalities. And there was no difference between modalities in detecting conventional adenomas that were 10 millimeters or bigger, which I think ultimately is what, you know, that and, and sessile serrated polyps are probably the ones we're most interested in. But I thought this was a very interesting study. Their conclusions were that for colonoscopists who are high detectors, uh, forward viewing high definition instruments dominate the fuse system, uh, indicating that for these examiners, image resolution is better than the angle of view. 
Um, and furthermore, the endocuff was the dominant strategy over the endo rings or no other exposure devices on a forward viewing HD colonoscope. Mm -hmm. So something to consider incorporating into your practice. Um, I know for us on the advanced team, we typically just use a distal cap, clear cap. We know we may be doing a complex EMR uh, or looking for flat polyps or something like that. So something to think about. I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> Another very hot, uh, hot abstract which uh, received a lot of attention uh, was this much-awaited prospective trial looking at the benefit of placing endoclips after performing large EMR. Uh, so the question comes, what is the need for closure? And we, I think we talk about this every week with Jerry when he shows one of his uh, EMRs. What is the need for closure of the mucosal defect after EMR of a large, meaning two centimeters or greater, non-pedunculated polyp. Would this reduce the incidence of delayed bleeding? So this was a huge multi-center study, randomized 19 expert centers. All patients had to have a two centimeter or larger non-pedunculated polyp, and they were simply randomized to get clip closure versus no clip closure. The primary outcome was incidence of severe delayed bleeding, which was defined as any patient requiring hospitalization, transfusion or an intervention to control bleeding. And the secondary outcomes were the incidence of delayed bleeding stratified by use of whether they were on anticoagulants or not, or polyp size or location. So they randomized 925 patients, the mean age was 65, and the, the clip group 455, control group 470, and the main outcome was that the use of CLIPS had an overall significantly decreased rate or incidence of delayed bleeding, roughly by half. And when you look at the other outcomes, so any serious adverse event, basically if you had CLIPS placed, it decreased it by half. Uh, we already mentioned the bleeding. No difference in the groups if, uh, regarding perforation, post-polypectomy, or abdominal pain. Delayed bleeding went from 7.2% to 3.7%, and days to bleeding, interestingly, was greater. So these patients who did have delayed bleeding, it, it often occurred later uh, than those in the control group who typically had bleeding, uh, you know, within a day or so. There were, with anticoagulants, there was no significant difference in statistical difference but more patients in the control group who are on anticoagulants bled compared to those in the CLIP group. But when you look at the actual effect size, sort of the reduction in bleeding, um, it was really the same whether you were on anticoagulants or not. So, you know, here 9.7 to 6, here 6% to 3%. Uh, similarly with polyp size, didn't, didn't appear that polyp size had any major effect on uh, bleeding rates and the effect of reduction was the same, whether it was greater than four centimeters or smaller than four centimeters. And I think the other more important thing, which is a, a pretty major outcome, I think, is that the effect was seen predominantly in proximal right-sided polyps. So overall, large randomized trial, endoscopic clip closure of the defect following large non-pedunculated polyps significantly reduced the incidence of delayed bleeding events and overall complications when compared to no clip closure, and this protective effect was restricted to large polyps proximal to the transverse colon and independent of the use of periprocedural antithrombotic agents. Um, this was a very interesting concept, use of endoscopy to treat diabetes. Uh, so the concept here is that anatomically, the duodenum is the first site of fuel recognition at the time of nutrient intake. In animal models and human models, uh, the duodenum mucosa exhibits abnormal, abnormal hypertrophy and endocrine hyperplasia in the presence of diabetes. Gastrointestinal bypass or any other kind of exclusionary device like a du an endoluminal sleeve with, uh, can prevent contact between the duodenum mucosa, bile, and nutrients, and that has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity and beta cell function and that when you take, like let's say rats who have had uh, exclude uh, gastric bypass surgery, when you reintroduce, um, uh, when you re-expose the duodenum to those nutrients, all of those beneficial effects get reversed. So the concept here 
is that if you can do duodenal mucosal resurfacing by an endoscopic procedure, uh, that may confer similar metabolic events. And the concept here is a device called the fractal device. Um, this was a single arm open label multicenter trial in patients with type 2 diabetes. And basically this is a one-time endoscopic intervention. It's no different than when we use a balloon to do radiofrequency ablation for Barrett's esophagus. It's a similar concept, slightly bit of a different uh, ablation system, it basically uses hot water. Um, but basically you, you alter the mucosa and you get regeneration of mucosa. And what they demonstrated was that a single procedure produce sustained reductions in hemoglobin A1C, fasting plasma glucose, and this HOMA-IR, which is a homeostasis model assessment index, um, as well as observed reductions in transaminase levels for patients with NASH and fatty liver for up to a year. So I think this was just the, uh, the initial uh, data that was shown, and there's an ongoing larger uh, prospective randomized study. So I will skip the pancreatic cyst stuff um, and tell you about the most important outcome of DDW, um, which occurred recently, and that is I got engaged last night. <laughs> that was not randomized or controlled. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Congratulations. <laughs> Amazing. What's her name? Was the ring random? Joanne. That's the ring So Chris sends a text message last night that said she said yes. <laughs> Oh, I think Chris. Oh, I changed what? the slides again. I think I just accidentally closed the presentation. Ah. Oh, okay. So you know I have it here. Don't worry. There you go. Got it. Got it. All right. Okay. So yeah, Chris got it right. All right. So from a divisional point of view, DDW. If this is the DDW wrap up, from a divisional point of view, DDW was outstanding. So there were more than a hundred um, abstracts, presentations, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so I wanted to use some of my time to show you some of the things that happened divisionally. My most important thing for um, to show is a picture of Jerry from DDW's past. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but here's DDW present. So these were uh, Raju from uh, Texas took a bunch of these pictures of Jerry during the time. So uh, we had a reception at the Spy Museum. Uh, it looked really good for those of you who were there. For those of you who weren't, these are some of the highlights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's still in the pictures. That's good, right? Quite the motley crew. Oh, look at them. <laughs> I didn't have time to edit and look for the best pictures of these. I just grabbed what I had. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> after celebration we had a booth from the booth uh, there was like Facebook live stuff going on um, all sorts of um, other activities pretty cool um, there were posters okay so I don't have pictures of everybody's poster but these are some representative posters um, Ryan and uh, quite a lot of others in the room here um, this is um, Ruby and Steve Itzkowitz's pay, uh, poster and it's got the little blue presidential uh, winner there this is Tony on his oral presentation um, here's Zach doing the, um, the video forum. Zach on the big screen. Zach winning the That's basically the <laughs> the Emmy Award for <laughs> best presentation. So congratulations to Zach and Nikhil and everybody else who participated in that. Um, here's Shivani on the big screen showing the conclusions. It was all very good. All right, so those were uh, those were to me those were a lot of the DDW highlights. Um, from a GI bleeding perspective, I wanted to highlight three things very quickly. Um, one is just to let you know about a, a new um, GI bleeding scoring system called the Simple System, um, basically helping to us to decide when to intervene in patients who have suspected upper GI bleeding. There are a number of them that are out there. They're not actively being used here um, in most situations, but I think some of them should. Um, the, one, the two that are most commonly used are the Glasgow Blatchford score, um, the AIM um, S65. The Glasgow Blatchford score is the one that's been advocated most for using to try to determine whether endoscopic intervention is needed in patients who have mostly upper GI bleeding. So there's been a previously developed simple system, which is really simple. Um, you get three points, basically. One um, is if you haven't been 
uh, using proton pump inhibitors during the week before the exam. The second is something they've called the shock index, which I think is cool. If your heart rate is bigger than your, is greater than your systolic blood pressure, that's a bad sign. Um, that's, that's the shock index, okay? And, um, and if you're, essentially if your BUN over creatinine ratio is over 30, that gets you a point. And the most you can get on this system is three. So this is a multi-center trial um, at three centers um, in Europe. Uh, for three years, and they basically were looking at, um, you know, whether this shock and whether this simple index could predict high-risk endoscopic stigmata. They looked at um, 637 of consecutive 1,486 patients who had high-risk stigmata, and without going through too many of the details, um, the simple score system um, actually performed better than the Glasgow Blatchford score or the other scores. Um, and if you set the um, simple cut off at two, so you got two of those three points, it did better than the, um, than the two other scoring systems. This is basically just a pitch for using some system here, and I just wanted to show that. Um, and they, they showed that, they, that the simple scoring system was better than the other two. Um, there's been a lot of interest in hemospray, so we did um, a little hemospray talk here recently. This is a registry from, um, again, Europe, looking at outcomes um, using hemospray and acute upper GI bleeding. Um, we all know about hemospray. So here they looked at over about a year and a half, the use of hemospray and all acute GI bleeding from 11 centers around different parts of Europe. Um, hemospray use was at the endoscopy, uh, endoscopist's discretion. It was either used as single therapy or as dual therapy with other endoscopic hemostatic techniques or as a rescue therapy once the standard methods failed. Um, they defined hemostasis as cessation of bleeding within five minutes, and re-bleeding was, was defined, as you can see. The results were really good. So um, they had 228 cases in their registry. Um, almost 90% achieved immediate hemostasis after endoscopic therapy with hemospray. Um, and it didn't really matter whether you used it as pr primary therapy, combination therapy, or rescue therapy. Peptic ulcer bleeding was the most common reason for using hemospray in this study. Um, and let me just show you that they were able to treat re-bleeding successfully as well. Um, there was some information about forest classification um, and which one was most likely to be successfully treated with hemospray. The Blatchford score, which was their predictive score that they were using, was higher in patients who had re-bleeding. Um, but um, the bottom line was that hemostasis was achieved in almost 90% of patients um, not going to cover that table. Their conclusion and my conclusion too is that hemospray is really effective. The one thing that came out at DDW in some of the bleeding sessions that I went to is the hemospray is really effective for about 12 to 24 hours and then it washes away. So you need to think about what the etiology of the bleeding is and make sure that you're treating the underlying etiology. So for example, in peptic ulcer bleeding, this is wonderful, but the effect goes away 12 to 24 hours later and the lesion may bleed again. Um, Finally, um, Chris talked about CLIPS for large EMRs. I'm going to just show you some data that was shown about postpalpectomy um, prophylactic clipping and whether it impacts on postpalpectomy bleeding. Um, we talk about this a lot, and actually a lot of people have come to the um, practice of just clipping everything, and then this study basically shows you that that may not be such a good idea. So it's a large study from Japan um, looking at prophylactic clipping after palpectomy for all polyps. Um, and clearly, uh, clipping has been shown to be efficacious in large polyps, in large pedunculated polyps, patients receiving anticoagulants. Some really interesting stuff recently in the um, GI literature about uh, patients getting bridge therapy with heparin um, and uh, fractionated heparin who had been on anticoagulants and those patients much more likely to bleed. So there may be a role for prophylactic clipping in those people. But in this study, um, looking at prophylactic clipping in general, um, this was, again, an open-label randomized control trial for four years in 10 participating um, centers in Japan, mostly, um, looking at over 1,000 patients clipping polyps that were less than 20 millimeters. They had a clip group, the PC group, or the non-PC group, um, and they excluded, in this case, patients who were receiving any coagulant therapy or bridge therapy. So this truly was a relatively low-risk population. Um, they looked at the difference in the two groups. Um, they excluded 41 patients. They wound up with over 1,000 patients um, clipping almost 3,000 lesions. Um, the non-clip group 
the non-prophylactic clip group um, showed no difference in bleeding than the prophylactic clip group. These were less than two centimeters. Less than two centimeters. And that's really the take-home message for this, is that in polyps are less than two centimeters where patients aren't on any coagulation or aren't on any other of these high-risk situations, prophylactic clipping is not actually going to change the outcome. Prophylactic clipping is not recommended in general because of the low preventive preventive effect for <coughs> post-polypectomy bleeding. And that is the uh, <laughs> that was part of the bond exhibit at the Spy Museum. So that is my report. It's a conference that Chris's study that showed a, a benefit to it, but those are in polyps that are those greater are than two centimeters. It's basically right? yeah. large right-sided polyps are the ones that benefit. All right, Dr. Smith. Yes. Let's see. There you go. Thank you. All right, so our benevolent overlord, Dr. Perman, told me I have five <laughs> minutes to do Barrett's and GERD, and I said, <laughs> that's funny. So we're just going to focus in on uh, Barrett's ablation because that's about all I have time to do and keep us on track here. So just to remind everybody that radiofrequency ablation for Barrett's has really become the, the standard now in what we use. Uh, it uses a heat-mediated tissue effect uh, to, uh, to basically boil the intracellular water off, causing irreversible cell injury. It's composed of a bipolar array of, uh, of electrodes that are run either on a, an endoscope-mounted probe or on a balloon that's attached to a catheter, um, and uh, that uh, creates an electrical field when the, en the energy is applied, leading to that frictional heating of the intracellular water. We're going to focus on circumferential treatment for the abstract I'll show you, where we use a, a balloon-based system. Uh, in the old days, uh, when this uh, technology first came out in the mid-2000s, we used uh, actually two different sets of balloons to do a circumferential treatment. The first one was a sizing balloon that had no, uh, no wires or electrodes on it and was used to uh, size the esophageal diameter at one centimeter intervals all throughout the Barrett segment. And then we would pick a treatment balloon that was three centimeters in length that matched the diameter, the smallest diameter that was measured in that segment, everything from 18 up to 31 millimeters. Sorry, that's not centimeters, that's millimeters. And we used what we called a one clean one approach where we would uh, inflate the balloon, fire the electrodes, deliver the energy, take it down, then scrape off the coagulum. Uh, I think, believe Dr. DeMeo, I can credit you with the DeMeo cap process for, for uh, cleaning that. That's <laughs> un unfortunately, but, uh, and, and then uh, do a second ablation of that area once it had been cleaned. Uh, the new approach, a uh, newly designed balloon that came out a couple of years ago, is an auto-sizing balloon, so it eliminates that sizing step. And there's a single catheter that auto-sizes the balloon using pressure and resistance measurements, uh, and then uh, applies the energy. And now the catheter has a four a centimeter long treatment segment instead of a three centimeter segment, so it's a little bit longer, a little bit faster because you don't need to do that sizing step with a separate catheter. So the question that was raised uh, by the folks who conducted the abstract, that's Balghazi et al., was what's the optimal uh, circumferential RFA approach? And that the one clean one was what we used when we had a fixed diameter balloon that may or may not make great tissue contact, but maybe with an auto-sizing balloon we could be more, even more efficient than, uh, than going through the multiple step process where you have to remove the treatment balloon then do the clean and then replace the guide wire, replace the catheter with the treatment uh, electrodes mm -hmm. and fire again. And so uh, what they did is they looked at three different regimens for ablating two to nine centimeters of Barrett's esophagus, all of, almost all of which was at least low grade dysplasia and uh, all visible le lesions were resected with EMR or ESD prior to the RFA, just as we would do for standard of care. And the three regimens they looked at were the one clean one, which is the standard regimen, what they called a simple double, where they fired twice without cleaning in between, or a simple signal, just firing once with no cleaning, uh, to see what the outcomes would be. And their primary outcome was the percent of Barrett's regression, the secondary outcomes being adverse events and procedure duration difference. And what happened was that the Daily Safety Monitoring Board actually uh, stopped the enrollment in the simple double arm because they were experiencing a very high stricture rate, over 20% of the patients had a clinically significant <laughs> stricture. And the interesting thing about these strictures compared to what we normally see when we get a stricture, where if we dilate it once with a TTS balloon it resolves no problem, is that it needed a median di number of six dilations to achieve uh, restoration of luminal patency. And so uh, these were pretty significant strictures and at a much higher rate, about three times the published rate, and so therefore the DSMB said no more to the simple double arm and that was removed.
Um, and so then they, they finished out the enrollment in the other two arms, the simple single arm and the, and the one clean one standard arm. And what they found was that the, um, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the one clean one had a greater extent of Barrett's regression uh, compared to the simple single, so 85 versus 73 um, percent, and that a poor response, meaning less than 50 percent of the Barrett surface area ablation was achieved in, uh, in three times as many of the patients who had a simple single versus the one clean one. Then they looked at their secondary outcomes and said that the uh, simple double, that should not be simple double, that should be the one clean one, sorry, uh, took longer than simple single, not a surprise, 31 versus 17 minutes. Um, and that, but that the adverse events uh, were in the same frequency with no matter which of those two arms, with minor lacerations being by far the most commonly reported side effect. And so the take-home message from this group was that we should be using the standard one clean, one ablation method when we use the express balloon, and that uh, we, we are getting good results. In fact, uh, if you look at that, uh, the adequacy there, 85% uh, regression with a single treatment is quite good, uh, and that's probably due to a better uh, match of the balloon size to the luminal diameter, but that if we try to get too cute and too aggressive, we're probably going to create more problems because we're delivering more energy effectively into the wall, and it's probably uh, creating more strictures and more potential for uh, adverse events later on. So let's talk about a couple of other me uh, methods of Barrett's ablation in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, the next one that, that came up was hybrid APC, argon plasma coagulation. And the, the hybrid is that we use a, a, uh, an injection of submucosal water to provide a cushion after which APC is performed at very high levels of power to really ablate off the Barrett's tissue. And the thinking is there is that you're creating that cushion of, of, uh, of tissue below the ablation zone so that you can fire at a high power to be efficacious, but theoretically lower your risk of stricture because you're just treating the mucosal surface with that submucosal cushion. And so there was an HAPC trial that was performed in nine European centers. Uh, almost all of the patients had dysplasia or cancer. And again, just like the last trial and most of the Barrett's trials that are out there in the literature, uh, resection was allowed to flatten out the, the mucosa before the, uh, the field ablation technique was applied. You were allowed to get up to five of these uh, HAPC treatments. And the primary endpoint was the ability to uh, create a C0, M0 esophagus with no Barrett's per prog classification and at least one set of negative biopsies uh, taken with the Seattle protocol post ablation. And what they found in the 126 patients that were able to complete the protocol by the time the abstract was submitted uh, was that 97 of them, or 77%, had an endoscopically normal Z-line. Six of these had intestinal metaplasia on biopsies. So the primary endpoint of both endoscopically negative and histologically negative uh, was achieved in this pure group in 72%. But interestingly, there were another 23 patients that didn't have a perfectly uh, regular Z-line, but did have negative biopsies. And so because it wasn't a nice, uh, nice regular Z, they didn't count it in the primary endpoint. But if you add those 23 patients to the 91 from the first zone, we actually had a 90% remission rate uh, complete remission of intestinal uh, metaplasia using uh, histologic criteria, which is quite good compared to other Barrett's trials out there. There were some complications. Nine patients had fever, six had some strictures requiring dilation, but nothing, it sounds like, in the degree of severity that the uh, over-treating with the circumferential <laughs> RFA balloon showed. Five patients had bleeding, and one patient had a perforation that was treated conservatively with clips. And the take-home message here is that the data looks pretty promising for this modality, but we need some more data uh, from some larger studies and, and certainly beyond just a couple of centers. So the last treatment uh, modality I want to talk about with you is uh, liquid nitrous oxide, which is a, uses a balloon-based device to uh, aim uh, the cryogen at the site with a diffuser mounted right through the middle of the balloon. Uh, each site receives a single treatment of about 10 seconds, about two square centimeters, uh, or so can be treated with one treatment. And the thinking is with cryoablation versus RFA that you're actually just sort of hibernating the extracellular matrix, not killing it off with thermal therapy. And so that probably allows you a little bit easier and faster healing and perhaps better tolerance by the patient as well. And so the aim of this study from Ben Munster et al. was to compare post-procedural pain following both focal RFA and cryoballoon for Barrett's ablation, looking at 46 patients uh, that were non-randomized for treatment of short segment Barrett's at two centers. 
Uh, all Barrett's, visible Barrett's and the EGJ were treated uh, at each visit, just as we would with standard uh, of care. And then they did a 14-day digital diary with each patient to look at symptoms and did a three-month follow-up EGD to look at regression data. And what they found was that both the peak level of pain and the duration of the pain for cryo balloon was significantly less than it was for the RFA patients. And if you looked at the area under the curves for uh, that 14-day digital diary for pain, dysphagia, and analgesic use, all of them were significantly smaller for cryo balloon than for RFA. Uh, although, interestingly, there was a, sim a similar median of Barrett's regression, 88% versus 90%, which is really pretty much nothing, even though you have two expert, uh, expert endoscopists looking at the, the visual regression and the images, pretty hard to tell the difference between those two in a Barrett segment, especially a short segment one. And so the take-home points on this side seem to be that, that cryo balloon for short segment Barrett seems to generate less pain, uh, but the efficacy is preserved compared to RFA. However, this is a non-randomized study. There was no discussion of adverse events in the abstract, and we certainly need some randomized data, perspective data, uh, to help us look at this. Just as a, a, a little shout out, uh, we have been approved as a site for a uh, trial using uh, cryo balloon for refractory Barrett's that is not responded to RFA. Uh, so please uh, see myself, Chris, Nikhil, or Satish uh, to discuss that uh, if you have a patient that you think might be a good candidate. Um, we're really excited about that and there's some nice technical innovations with the device as well that will make it uh, even more efficient than just doing the focal treatments and those were just FDA approved and introduced at DDW. But I don't have time because our overlord has said time's up. So thanks very much everybody. Thanks.